That was truly amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. Um, I'm going to start out with asking about language. You both talk a lot about uh, the importance of the diversity of language in, in many different ways. And I just wanted to see, do you have examples of how diversity of language in your own life and work has kind of unlocked important solutions or epiphanies or uh, new kinds of narratives? I would love to hear more about that. Um, Elijah, I'll start with you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for the mm -hmm. question. And also, I just want to say I'm so happy that we both bring in the matriarchy into yes. both of our stories. So thank <laughs> yes. you for that. Um, when I think about language every day, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have the privilege and honor of running a all-black, queer-led team. And as purveyors of intersectional content, we're constantly learning about various different identities and experiences. Mm -hmm. And I think what's actually really beautiful about the work that we get to do in terms of a, a primary example is that we are not the keepers of this knowledge, right? So we are every day learning about individuals and the ways in which they are arriving in this world. But it's also quite challenging, right? Because the language is changing mm. and we are also changing with it. And so it is a deep honor and invitation for us to get a little bit closer each day to understanding how we play a role in allowing people to show up bravely who they are. Mm. Thank you. Sophia? I'll start with a story that I often think about, which is when I was younger, I, I grew up bilingual. My mom would always speak to me in Farsi, and my dad would speak to me in English. Uh, but at one point, my Farsi was better than my English. And I remember because I was in school, and my, I had wanted to ask my friend for a hair tie, and I didn't know what the, the word was in English. And I was like, a kesh, and she didn't know what I was saying. Uh, and I went home, and I thought it was so funny, and I told my parents, and they were so scared. Because they told me, well, we moved to the United States so that you could have an incredible future and an incredible education, and that means you have to know how to speak English. Uh, and so for a few years, I stopped speaking Farsi, or at least um, we spoke much less Farsi in our home, and my English became much better. But I always think back to those days, and it really breaks my heart, because me knowing Farsi is the only reason I was actually able to start Climate Cardinals, and I'm so glad that my aunts very stubbornly started speaking Farsi with me again, because they were adamant that I would carry on uh, and continue our culture through language. Uh, and I, I love to, to think about that story because without the persistence of my family to ensure that I remained rooted in my culture and my narrative and my story, then I wouldn't have been up here sharing with all of you the, the emergence of Climate Cardinals. Thank you. I'm going to ask a similar question um, as I did earlier, but you know, there's so many different ways of approaching these really critical areas, and we've seen a lot of brilliant people across expertise uh, here at uh, CGI. Why did you feel called to stories and, and language as um, kind of the one that you really felt like you needed more love and investment? Uh, I'll start. Mm -hmm. Well. Kind of like what I was saying in my story, growing up, I, it was always a joke in my family that I was really outspoken and loud and I would go on tangents and get really, really passionate about things. Um, and because of that, my aunt would always tell me, you have to find something to do for your career that involves being able to speak and storytell. And I never knew what that would mean. I never knew what that could look like until when I was 19, I very much on a whim decided to apply to TED Talk's global idea competition with this big idea that if we wanted to tackle climate change, we had to be rooted in climate education, and more specifically, we had to be rooted in climate translation. Uh, and so I ended up somehow, against the odds, winning the contest, and I gave my debut TED Talk when I was 19 really about the power of storytelling and translation when it came to mobilizing people on climate. And that, for me, opened the doors to so many incredible opportunities that I've been fortunate to have. I mean, I'm 21, I'm still 
pretty young. <laughs> um, but it just opened the doors to so many opportunities that have really allowed me to relish the role and the title of being a storyteller and to hopefully inspire and mobilize many more people to get involved in the fight for climate change. Thank you. As someone who is also a climate storyteller and passionate about climate communication. Do you? Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. yeah you know, as right, the executive director and a co-founder of a media and storytelling mm -hmm. platform, I think that I love what the power of storytelling has in these types of spaces. Mm -hmm. I think there is a softness that allows us to arrive in a way that feels really tender and poignant. And I think that a lot of these big concepts and a lot of these really, really difficult, nuanced challenges are able to be, I don't think broken down here in the story format, but I think that they're handled with so much grace. And so when um, my lovely friends over at the Elevate Prize Foundation reached out around this opportunity, I think, and they know I ask a lot of questions. I'm a very inquisitive person. I just would like to know how I'm arriving and so I can arrive with the most intent. But I think what stuck out to me was how these types of spaces have been specifically designed to build bridges between larger conversations that are happening throughout this space. And so I'm really, really happy that we're landing here today with such a nuanced approach to exploring what language means in all of our work and how so much of that is unique to the individual sharing the story. Yeah. Um, jumping off of that, you know, I came up in the climate movement and we, you know, full of absolutely brilliant people that I've been honored to work with, but we uh, have just historically not invested much into storytelling as a movement, and I think that's true for most progressive er issue areas. So what would be sort of your call to action around storytelling and why uh, all of us should be taking it much more seriously and investing more in it? Oh. I love that question. <laughs> it's what I tell all of my artists that I work with. It's what I tell anyone that is navigating and oscillating within my orbit is bravery. Mm. Oh my goodness, like, and not just being courageous, right? Not just being fierce, but getting really, really close to what it feels like to be brave in your truth and in your authenticity so that when you're sharing and you're communicating your stories, they don't feel far away from you, mm. right? They are of you. And what I love about storytelling and what I love about the, the, the power of storytelling, as I shared with the, the journey that my, my, my mother brought me on, was that there's such a beautiful experience and exchange that happens when you are in a place of owning your story mm. and building power within it to be able to gift it to someone, mm -hmm. right? And then as the individual who's receiving it, you get all of this opportunity to immerse yourself in an experience that you would have never been able to have because no one can tell that story the way that you can. Mm -hmm. Sophia, you have... I completely agree with you, especially on the topic of bravery. Of course, coming from an immigrant family, I think the most stereotypical thing my parents always advocated was that I should pursue a STEM career and I should study something very sensible like computer <laughs> science. Uh, and when I told them I was much more interested in policy and history and climate science, mm. they were a little skeptical, which I understood, of course, because you don't move to America willy-nilly to become a storyteller <laughs> without a concrete career plan. But being able to authentically follow what has become my passion has led me into rooms and through experiences I never in a million years could have imagined and that my parents also in a million years never could have imagined. And especially in a world with AI, with ChatGPT, the most precious commodity in my opinion is going to be creativity. Mm -hmm. And the people who are able to take what is plain hard science or very 
formal written English mm -hmm. and turn it into something compelling and beautiful and uh, stories that capture the world. And the last thing I'll say is I often return to the example of when that video was circulating throughout social media of that sea turtle that had a plastic straw on its nose. And it was that singular video that caused dozens of cities across the world to ban plastic straws, dozens of private corporations, and that's a story. Videos, social media, photos, this is all a vehicle for storytelling, and that's how we spark mass movements and mass change when people are truly inspired by others. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, well, thank you so much. I can't wait to hear many more of your stories, and I'm just really appreciative. Let's give them a round of applause, Eliza and Sophia. Um...